Well, this morning, I wanted to share with you something that I think is so timely and so important, so necessary, because it has to do with discernment and discretion. Two words we don't hear of a lot anymore, yet the Bible speaks of it all the time. The Bible is very clear on the fact that we ought to be able to discern and have discretion. I call these two the power twins, and you will see why. Um, discernment, says Jay Adams, is to be is to separate God's ways from all other ways. If I had to ask how many of you would like to walk as God wants for you to walk, you would raise your hand. If I had to say how many of you need to walk more closely with God and more accurately according to His will, all the God-fearing people would raise their hands. It's the godless person that goes, "No, I'm doing, I'm good." <laughs> It's the God-fearing person that goes, I need to think more like God. I need to walk according to His ways. I need to honor Him more. I need to love Him more. I need to glorify Him more with my life. However, there's no possible way for us to get from where we are to where we need to be without discernment and discretion. It's almost like saying, you know, I want to go, I want to go from here to now, look at me. All right. I want to go here from here to the mall. I'm trying to come up with an example, and I, I realize my example is not working. But if I want to go from here to the mall, I actually have to take golf. Uh, let's say all these other roads were closed, okay? <laughs> so I want to go from where I'm at to where I need to be. I have to take a certain path there. And God's path for us to maturity is, in fact, discernment and discretion. Uh this statement by Charles Spurgeon has become pretty famous here among us here at Christ Nation. He says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Because discernment is what slices away all the deceptions in your life. And for something to be deceptive, it actually has to look like the real thing. That's why Satan comes as an angel of light. He has to look like the real thing in order to deceive. Discernment is, in fact, <clears throat> the fruit of the mature believer. The way you know somebody is mature is by seeing their discernment and their discretion. Now, the words discernment and discretion are very oftentimes exchanged within scriptures. There is a distinction between the two, but very easily can be used one for the other. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, But solid food is for the who? The mature. Who are the mature? Then it goes on and says, Those who have the powers of discernment trained. How do they have their, tra their discernment trained? By constant practice. Practicing to do what? Distinguishing between good and evil. Let's walk through that verse again quick. But solid food is for the who? The mature. Who are they? Those who have the powers of discernment trained. How do they have the powers of discernment trained? By constant practice. Practicing what? Practicing to distinguish between good and evil. Now, when you see somebody who's able to do that, you have found a mature Christian. The immature Christian is the one who seems blind to good and evil. They seem confused between right and wrong. No matter how many times they're told, this is what the scripture says, they'll go like, yeah, but, yeah, but I, I just don't know. That's the confusion that comes because somebody isn't mature enough to have discernment and therefore discretion. Let me say that again. You have discernment, therefore you can be discreet. You cannot be discreet as somebody who has no discernment. But we see here that discernment and discretion is in fact the fruit of the person who has matured in Christ. They've grown up. They're now a spiritual adult. King Solomon was known for his power of discernment. He was able to make many wise decisions. And he made very 
you made great moral judgments. It says in 1 Kings 3, 9, he was speaking to God and God had said to him, Solomon, what would you like? I'll give you anything you want. And here's his answer to that question. In verse 9, he says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may do what? Discern between good and evil for who is able to govern your great people in order to lead, in order to govern. You have to be able to know the difference between good and evil. That's discernment. And then use the conclusion of your discernment to act discreetly. Impossible to be a leader in a church without it. One cannot ascend to a leadership position as we have our elders coming to a place of being introduced pretty soon here, next week as a matter of fact. Discernment is required. It cannot be a leader. This is what he said right there. It cannot be a leader without it. Give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern the people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to govern this great person, great people? Who is able to govern your, govern your people, God? The one with discernment is. And then in, in, in just two verses later, in verse 11 through 12, it says, And God said to him, Solomon, because you have asked this and have not asked yourself long life or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right because you chose this, because you desire discernment. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before and none like you shall arise after you. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. I want to add something here that I think is important for us to see. The implication of this is what? God was talking to Solomon. And as he was speaking to Solomon, and Solomon was speaking to him, Solomon told God what he wanted. And it wasn't the voice of God. Because they were already speaking to each other. It was the ability to discern as God would discern. It was able, it was the ability to make decisions the way God would make them. So I want to show you here the dis difference between discernment and discretion. Discernment is having insight into a situation. Discernment is having insight into a situation. It is to have wisdom for a decision. It is to have sufficient knowledge to make the best possible distinctions between two things. You have two things, and you can see that these two issues, one will glorify God in a greater way than the other. That is discernment, making a distinction, something the world has completely lost the ability to do. That's discernment. However, discretion, on the other hand, is knowing how to apply the wisdom and the knowledge gained from your discernment. So discretion is the action part of discernment. It's almost like wisdom and knowledge. You know, you know, knowledge is what you have. Wisdom is your ability to apply that knowledge. Discernment is what you have. Discretion is your ability to apply that discernment that you have. Does it make sense to everyone? So it's really a call to action when you say somebody is discreet. Well, to be discreet is to know what to say, to know when to say it, to know who to say it to, and to know how to say it. That's discretion. Have you ever met somebody with no discretion? They're painful. Because <laughs> they always say the thing that shouldn't be said. They're always like a train wreck, right? That's somebody with no discretion. There are benefits to discernment. Proverbs 3, 21 through 24 says, My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. And they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Adornment for your neck. It's like people wear jewelry 
they adorn themselves with it. Jewelry says something. It makes beautiful the one wearing it. It speaks of something. A king wears certain jewelry. So jewelry is, is, is very significant to understand what it is and what it does, but it certainly makes something beautiful, right? Or someone beautiful. Let me say that. So here it says, My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and, dis- and discretion. Wisdom and discretion, they will be life for your soul. And adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely. And your foot will not stumble. If you lay, lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Now look at Proverbs 2 verse 11. We're talking about discretion. And the benefits of it. It says discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. So in other words, the person with no discretion gets himself in trouble all the time. The person with discretion, he's safe because he knows what to say, when to say it, how to say it, who to say it to. He understands context. However, there are many purposes. Let's go to discernment. There are many purposes to, know, to discernment, knowing the difference between right and almost right. There's, there are purposes to it. The first is to protect you from being deceived. It is the person who doesn't have discernment that, that usually walks in deception in so many places in their life. It's discernment that is necessary. I think you will agree with me that today, this one thing is what the church needs most is discernment. Knowing how to discern right from wrong. So discernment, we see, protects you from being deceived. It helps you recognize what God is, in fact, doing in the world. If you look at everything going on, can you see what God is doing? Most people can only see what the devil's doing. But the one with discernment sees what God is allowing the devil to do in order to play into his hand. Somebody goes, God doesn't do that. Yes, of course he does. God allowed things to play out perfectly. He allowed evil to run its course perfectly all the way to the cross. And then he judged those who crucified Christ. They played into his hand and then he judged them for it. Yes, he ordains evil. Of course he does. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. If he couldn't ordain evil, then evil will do whatever evil wanted and that would also include throwing him off of the throne. <laughs> you better believe God is sovereign. Because if he didn't, trust me, you're in Satan's hands. That's literally what people believe when they do not believe that God is sovereign. No, God is sovereign, meaning you are in God's hands. And he allows all things to work together for the good. Because everything and everyone plays into his hands, his purposes, and his plans. Remember last week we talked about the, the immutability of God? Not only is his character immutable or his essence is immutable, nothing about him changes. But we also saw neither does his purpose, do his purposes change, neither would, could his plans change. It's impossible for his purposes to be delayed and his plans to be upended because somebody decided that they're not going to play with. No, God actually has the ability to make all things work together for his purposes. You had, you had the Roman soldiers, you had all the Jewish leaders, they all played straight into God's hands, and they crucified Christ. Yes, God allows things to happen when it is according to his plan. So here, we see that the purposes of discernment is to help us not be deceived, to look at the world and see what's happening and discern God's hand in it. To recognize what God is doing in us. You might be going through a hard time. You might be going through loss. You might be going through suffering. 
Can you discern what God is doing in you through those things? We had a fantastic men's night last Thursday, and we talked exactly about this since that's the portion of Scripture we were covering. But suffering as a believer takes on many forms, many different forms. And we went through all those forms. Tom, I believe there were 10 or so. Forms of the suffering of the believer. But when you go through any of those sufferings, those hard times or the loss that you're experiencing, can you see what is God currently doing in your life? If you can, that is discernment. It's almost like I'm taking my child and I'm giving my child a good whipping and my child leaves the room and somebody says, what do you get a whipping for? He says, actually, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, that wasn't very helpful, was it? <laughs> like, if God is disciplining me, it would be good for me to discern as to why he is. So I could possibly change my ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> the purpose of discernment is to distinguish between what is important compared to that which is most important. And I think here we fall on the wayside many times. We're chasing after something because it's important, is it? It is, but it's not most important. That's why you shouldn't be doing it. There are many important things we ought not to give ourselves to until we've given ourselves to the most important thing. But you couldn't know the difference without discernment. Discernment helps us distinguish between the primary and the secondary things. It helps us distinguish between what is essential and what is non-essential. It helps us distinguish, and, and honestly, just that point right there proves that the church has lost their ability to discern. Because everything we just went through when it comes to being essential versus non-essential we realized that, you know, strip clubs are essential while churches are non-essential. And we went, oh, okay, let's close up doors. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because lack of discernment. The purpose of discernment is to distinguish between what is better complete to, uh, compared to that which is best. Yeah, sure, this would be better to do, but it's still not the best thing to do. Especially, let's say, for instance, practical example, you have two career paths to follow, two job offers. Well, the one is better financially, but the other one is best because it enables you to be a better husband, a more present father. And, but people lose discernment because they don't know the difference between better and best. They don't know the difference between primary and secondary. They don't know the difference between important and most important. To discern is to look at something, measure it against Scripture. Discernment is the ability to take a philosophy and measure it to Scripture, a, an ideology, measure it to Scripture, a theology, and measure it to Scripture, the Word of God. This is why it's important to educate your understanding with Bible doctrine, because without it, it will be absolutely impossible for you to actually discern. It's like, could you measure that wall without a measuring stick, without a measuring tape? Being educated in Bible doctrine is the only way for us to learn how to think God's thoughts after Him. It is the only way for us to use a divine measuring stick to see so yeah, this is good, but it's not best. To discern is to have the ability of making decisions between two things, distinctions between two things. And I'm sure you will agree with me that this generation, as I mentioned, have lost that ability to discern. Think of it. Discerning is the difference between good and evil. It's, a, it's distinguishing between right and wrong. It's making distinctions between justice and injustice. Knowing the difference between male and female, making distinctions, lost it. Don't have it anymore. Can't see the difference between child and adult. We've lost that distinction altogether. Adults are not treating children as adults. And children are treating adults as children. 
One of the problems we had with the school that my son was in when he was in elementary school is that all the teachers would call him friend. And he'd call him my friend. I'm like, which friend? No, like, that's your friend? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. She's older than me, and she's your friend. <laughs> We've lost the difference between or the ability to make distinctions between things. We've lost our ability completely to make distinctions between a political figure and his policies. Lost our ability to make difference between a disagreement and an argument. It's like, no, I'm not arguing with you, I'm disagreeing with you. We've lost our ability of making distinctions between disagreeing with somebody and hating them. We've lost our ability to make distinctions between feelings and thoughts. They aren't the same thing. You aren't every thought that comes to your mind. Thank God. <laughs> lost the difference between who you are and your desires. Well, that's who I am. God made me this way. No, repent from it. <laughs> that's the point. Right? Lost the difference between what is important and essential. We've lost the difference between orthodoxy and heresy. We can't make distinctions anymore. We dare not make distinctions anymore when it comes to theology because the first thing you hear is, what are you saying? I'm not saved? <laughs> it's like literally the moment you make a distinction, people feel like you send them to hell. So our foundational text that I wanted us to look at here is in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. It says, but examine everything. Can everybody please say examine everything? Examine everything. Yeah. Hold firmly to that which is good and abstain from every evil. Now, Paul is commanding us here to exhort and exhorting us to examine everything. But he meant everything because he, he said everything because that's what he meant. Everything. Including your own mind and your own heart. And then hold on to that which passes the test when you measure it against scripture, not culture. And then what you do is you let go of the things that fail the test. If there's one thing that has weakened us is our ability to do that. Actually, MacArthur said, quote, throughout history, the lack of discernment has contributed more harm to the church than all the persecution combined. I agree with that 100%. While persecution refined, you know, and purified the church, the lack of discernment, and on the other hand, crippled the church completely. Think about it. Persecution has been part of the, the growth of the church. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons the church grows. Because when you look at the apostles, and you see every single one of them were persecuted, and then martyred, you go like, there's got to be something there, isn't there? <laughs> who's going to die for a person they know is a fraud no they know he's not that's why they were willing to die for him <clears throat> this is Satan's goal for the church the church need to lack discernment if the church can lack discernment it's in no time they will be so far off course they will no longer look like a church at all that is why Satan, the father of lies, has to come to us as an angel of light. Because in that way, the ones without discernment will follow. Not recognizing the angel of light is because we have no discernment. Scripture is, as a matter of fact, emphatic about this. Scripture warns us of the doctrines of demons, of destructive heresies, of myths, perverse teachings, commandments of men, speculations, deceitful spirits. Worldly fables, false knowledge, empty philosophies, traditions of men, worldly wisdom. As a matter of fact, every single one of those that I just listed out of scriptures cannot be, if, if you've been warned against them, um, you couldn't follow that warning or heed that warning without discernment. It takes discernment to recognize doctrines of demons. It takes discernment to recognize destructive heresies. It takes discernment to recognize a myth. It takes discernment to recognize perverse teaching. 
to de determine or recognize commandments of men or speculations or deceitful spirits or worldly fables or false knowledge. It takes discernment to recognize those things. And because the church has lost, they have a lack of discernment, they actually give themselves to most of these. It almost seems that the warning against deception is on every page of the Bible. That's why Jesus said wolves will come in, in sheep's clothing. And Paul said that the wolves will come and they will not spare the flock. In Matthew 16, verse 1 and 4, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up. It says, in putting Jesus to the test, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening, you say, it'll be fair weather and the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm. There will be a stormy day or there will be a storm today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you are unable to discern the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation wants a sign, and so a sign will not be given to them except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So he said to them, your problem is simple. You're bad at discerning the weather. You're bad at predicting it, and you're even worse at discerning the things of God. That was a put down from Jesus to them. Jesus was telling them that they have no ability to discern the truth. And who was the truth? The one standing in front of them. So he was standing, the very truth of God was standing in front of them. And he's saying, you, you struggle to discern the weather, but you're even worse at discerning who I am. So let's return to our foundational text of today, and we'll draw uh, from it and see what Paul meant when he, what, by what he said. In 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it starts off by saying, but examine everything. The word examine here means to test. So in other words, Paul commanded us to exercise discernment by testing everything to see whether it's genuine or whether it's false, whether it's wrong or whether it's bad or whether it's good. This term, examine everything, could also be accurately translated as, okay, now test everything in your life. Test your attitude. Test your thought. Test your commitment. Test your faithfulness to God. That same term, examine everything, also can be translated as judge everything or evaluate everything in your life. For instance, your priorities. When last have we evaluated our priorities? God, are you first in my life or not? The person who has no discernment is the person who uses a broken measuring stick to discern. In other words, they measure things incorrectly. What do they use? Well, <coughs> excuse me. they use things like, quote, well, it feels good to me. That's why I'm going to believe it. It just sits right, you know. Well, that's not the way to measure something. Don't believe your heart. How many times do we have to cover the fact that your heart is deceitful? Don't follow your heart. Bad advice. Worst advice. Don't follow your heart. Follow Scripture. No matter how your heart feels, right? Right? That's discernment. But the person who cannot discern is the one who discerns with the wrong measuring stick. He's got the wrong tape out there. He's got the satanic tape instead of the divine tape, right? Okay, so people who, who do not have discernment or lack discernment would say something like, well, my mom says it's true, so it must be. This is what I've always believed. It's got to be true. Always believes it. That's the wrong measuring stick. Or, as long as it works for you, it's true, isn't it? No, it's not. A lot of things that shouldn't, that isn't true, work out. Like, like a bad girlfriend, right? <laughs> she said yes, didn't she? Yeah, but that was a really bad choice. Just because something worked out doesn't mean it was right or true. I believe this because most people say it's true. <clears throat> the way to examine everything is to make sure that everything is measured by Scripture. It violates Scripture. Your conscience should immediately arrest you. 
That's if your conscience is well informed according to Scripture. Then it says, Hold firmly to that which is good. Hold firmly means hold on tight. Don't let go. Embrace wholeheartedly. Take possession of all the things that are good. Then verse 22 says, Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain from every form of evil. It's a very strong word. The word is abstain there. It means to uh, hold yourself away. It's like you're pushing yourself away. Something's pushing up against you, like a car pushing up against you, and you are pushing away. Even if you're flying off this way, you, you're simply not going to let that thing touch you. Hold yourself away. Pull or rip yourself away to shun that which is evil. Throw it as far as you possibly can, as hard as you possibly can, as quick as you possibly can. That is to abstain, abstain from evil. Now the word evil there is interesting because when we think of evil, we think of Sam Smith, right? Because the last picture I saw of Satan was Sam Smith with, with horns on his head at the Super Bowl or something. I don't know. He was somewhere. I still throw up in my mouth every time I see that picture. <laughs> Now, the word evil there, as a matter of fact, is the perversion of truth. A perverted truth. In other words, abstain, rip yourself away from a twisted truth. When a twisted truth lands in your lap, throw it as fast as you possibly can. Get away from it. So hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from all evil. Every form of evil. In other words, this verse here, therefore, is calling us to discernment. So discernment is not necessarily the thing I feel. It is not subjective as much as what it is objective. It is not this emotional voice bubbling up within me, or it's not this sense that I have. It's not this superpower that I have. It is, uh, it's not me telling, another, telling you, hey, this other guy's shady. I just got a sh- I'm feeling he's shady. Well, that discernment can very easily become a, a judge, become a judgmental spirit within a person because you've been wrong many times. Now, discernment is the ability God gives you to use a scripture accurately and not twist it and not deform it. It's the ability to divide the word rightly and say, that's what this means, therefore, in this situation, this is wrong and that's right, says it. To have a strong hermeneutic is your ability to discern. I mean, we all know uh, we can just throw them out one after the other. <clears throat> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, yeah, if you have a good hermeneutic, you know that it has nothing to do with the next basketball game. Right? If you, if you have a good hermeneutic, in other words, you can divide the word rightly, you know, um, you know, for I have plans for your life. And Jeremiah 29, 11, how does it start? Then I'll be able to finish it. I know the plans that I have for you, not to harm you, but to. So bless you. And you have a hope. Yeah, he was saying that to the Israelites. He was sending them in. He was sending them into exile for 70 years. And he says, now go. You're going to go into exile because you're such a hard. You're, you're so stubborn. I'm sending you into slavery for 70 years, but trust me, this is because I'm disciplining you and it's going to be good for you. I'm doing this because there's a hope for you. Otherwise, I'll just cut you off altogether. And so we know when you, when you have a good hermeneutic, you can actually divide the word rightly. And if you divide the word rightly, you can actually have discernment because of it. But what people oftentimes like to do when it comes to discernment is that they, they don't want to do that work <laughs> It's a lot. They'd rather just feel it, feel it out. Which is exactly what it's not. The reason discernment is such an important subject is because throughout history, and especially now, we see that the church is drifting into error. You know, they're, they're rejecting doctrine for the sake of embracing relationships. That is so important. You know, principle before person. Don't have unprincipled relationships. Now, if you're ministering to somebody, go and minister to Judas. But don't allow Judas to minister to you, right? 
And the church has done that. The church has become seeker friendly because people were more important to them than principles. The church has drifted, becoming fascinated with entertainment, and they become bored with scriptural exposition. So when you consider the state of the church and the state of the culture, we will agree that our times cry out for men and women of discernment. Literally, this is what the world needs. Not what the world wants, but what the world needs. This is what the church needs, not what the church wants. We know what the church wants, the sheep. You know what sheep want? They want to stray. But what the sheep needs, yeah, is green pastures, is direction, is men and women of discernment. Leaders that can discern no matter what the cost is because discernment doesn't end up always being profitable financially speaking. God's men and women of the day will be men and women of discernment. Just like it was in the past, it's always been the same thing. History repeats itself. 500 years ago in the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, when it came to an end, the brave men, the the reformers actually, they started discerning wrong from right. They were going, wait a minute. This is what's being said, but that's what's been written. And what's written is not what's being said. Because discernment happened they could draw lines and the Reformation took place. The men and women who will be used by God in this ever darkening, darkening age will be those of discernment. <clears throat> so who lacks discernment? Who lacks it? Well, um, the one who knows that Scripture says one thing and then does the other. For instance, they know that Scripture says, do not be unequally yoked together, but still believes they're going to win that girlfriend over to Christ. <clears throat> if, if you can, if you can distinguish between your emotions and the truth, uh, you, you've got 99% of the battle won. Now all you need is the courage to say yes to truth and no to self, no to feelings. Who lacks discernment? The person who knows that Scripture says bad company corrupts good habits, but still allows themselves to sit in that company. He who walks with the wise shall be, but the companion of fools shall be, not fool, yeah, shall be destroyed. That's different, isn't it? I mean, to walk with somebody is to actually follow them where they go, right? It's like they go there, you go there with them. They go here, you go here with them. You're walking with them. You're doing life together with them. (laughs) I don't like that term, but you're walking with them. And if you're walking with wise people, you'll start making wise decisions no matter how hard it feels. You'll be able to make them because you're with these people. But if if... You're a companion of fools. In other words, you just hang with fools. You don't follow them. You just hang with them. You won't become foolish. You get destroyed. That's a promise from Scripture. And so who's the discerning? Who's the person who lacks discernment? The one who lacks discernment thinks he's exempt from that. And I'm speaking out of personal experience. You know, when, when, you, when you're in the ministry, when you're a leader or an elder in a church, you sometimes get tempted by thinking, well, that'll never happen to me. Yes, it will. Bad company will bring destruction. The one who lacks discernment thinks is the one who thinks he's exempt from something that Scripture has clearly stated. The one who lacks uh, discernment is the one that knows that Scripture prioritizes God, prioritizes God and tells him to put God first. But then he still goes on to make his career the most important thing in his life. Now that right there is a sermon on its own. Might as well, you know, (laughs) he can stop the service right there. But it's not just career. 
It's when we make somebody else more important than our relationship with God. It's when we make money more important. It's when we make our career, like I said, more important. If you make your family more important, you lack discernment. And then I said, the unteachable person cannot discern their own ignorance. That's the one who lacks discernment. Is If you find somebody who cannot be taught, guess what? They can't distinguish between what there is that they still need to learn and the current ignorance in which they live. That's why if you find somebody you cannot be taught, it, you've found somebody that cannot discern. Because there isn't one person that doesn't have a blind spot. We all have blind spots. There isn't one person that ought not to grow to the next level. Every single one of us need to grow. And the number one, the number one sign that you are maturing is the fact that you have become teachable. So, so interesting, like when, you, when your child is about to grow up, the first thing you have to teach them is to be teachable, right? Like, now you're going to have to listen to me, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> so who has discernment? A discerning person will, will acknowledge the worth of God's word. I'll share two verses with you and then we close. The first is Proverbs 8, verse 8 and 9. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Right to those who find knowledge. Can we please uh, have that in the New King James Version? Robert, is that possible? To put that in the New King James Version for me? All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Now, when they, while they're searching that in the New King James Version, I want to just say this, that without one, one of the people, the person, let me say it this way, who can cultivate the, the richest relationships in this life, is the person who has these two things. You want to say, well, you know, I'm really struggling to make good friends. Well, it's because, number one, it's friends you're looking for. Friends is a result because you and somebody else see the same thing, the same truth, and commit to it. Now, you're friends. But the, the reason some are really rich, some friendships are really rich, is because there exists these two things discernment and discretion knowing what to say knowing when to say it some people have no idea what to say or when to say it they always say the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person in the wrong way <clears throat> and then you go like no wonder this person is so alone and I'm like <laughs> so it's not everybody else's fault after all <laughs> it's their fault <laughs> do you have that in, New in the King James Version? Thank you, Han, for training. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I'm actually serious. Han's busy training like seven uh, seven people uh, at this time. This is wonderful. Proverbs 8, verse 8 and 9. All the words of my mouth are with, ri uh, are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse in them. They're all plain to him who, keep going, understands and right to those who find knowledge. And then in Hosea 14, verse 9. It says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Let's pray. Father, today, I pray, Father, that your word become a seed inside of us. Uh, it is an incorruptible seed, and it will produce discernment in us. It will produce discretion in us. Lord, help us that we will understand that you are calling us all to maturity. And this is what it looks like. Thank you, Father, for being patient with us. Thank you for, for being forgiving and merciful toward us as you allow us to grow up in you. In Jesus' name, amen.